2 Peter 3 tells us the Lord was, the Lord made the earth out of the water and in the water. When God first made the earth, the Bible tells us it, was the, it sits on the circle of the earth, and Christians have always known the earth is round. And it said he stretched out the heavens, stretched out the heavens. That phrase appears five or six times in the book of uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Lamentations, those, verse, those books about the stretching of the heavens. Today's atmosphere has six layers to it. There used to be, apparently, a seventh layer. This was a layer of water or ice or vapor above the atmosphere. Even today, our atmosphere has very distinct layers to it. And some people think that, and I do, I'm one of them, that there used to be a canopy of water or ice above the atmosphere. This is what's called the canopy theory. When God made the world, there was a canopy of either water or ice or vapor above the atmosphere. At the time of the flood, it all fell down. So it's gone. Whatever was up there is gone. So we can't prove any of this. This is just theoretical, that there must have been something above the atmosphere explaining why they lived to be 900, explaining a lot of things. A canopy of ice could have been held up by the Earth's magnetic field because super cold ice is magnetic. And it would be suspended by what is called the Meissner effect. You know, magnets will float on top of each other. That's one theory. I don't know. Carl Baugh's got a great book about that. But this canopy of water above the Earth protected it. Also, there was water under the crust of the Earth. If you read Psalm 24, it says, The Earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 136, he stretched out the earth above the waters. Most of the water that's now on the crust of the earth in the, surf, in the surface called oceans used to be inside the earth in big subterranean water chambers. I don't have a clue what the numbers were, but let's just pick a few for sake of argument. Suppose there was a layer of ice 10 or 20 or 30 inches thick above the atmosphere, and then a layer of air, 10 or 15 miles of air to breathe, and then a layer of rocks and dirt to stand on, the crust of the earth, maybe 10 miles, and then a layer of water underneath subterranean water chambers. That's the water that came shooting out to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open, Genesis chapter 7. And today, the earth is busted up like an eggshell. I think those cracks that we see, the fault lines, are probably places where the crust of the earth broke open and the water came out. We cover much more on that on video number 6 about the flood and the Hoven theory, of what happened to cause the flood. We still have these scars, fault lines. I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault. None of them my fault, but I've been there, done that, studied it, okay? There's no question the earth has cracks. The question is, when did this happen? Well, the textbooks in school say this is part of the Pangea theory. The continents are moving around. Well, I agree the continents are moving a little bit, but the Pangea theory is baloney. They shrank Africa 40% to make them fit. They took out all of Mexico and Central America. Hey, senor, que pasa? Donde esta Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? Hmm? They don't tell the kids. If you take the water out of the oceans, you'll notice there is dirt underneath. People say, hey, do you think the continents were connected? I say, what are you talking about? They still are. What do you mean, were they? Hello. Always have been connected. <laughs> They're still connected. What do you mean, were they? <laughs> Cover more on that in video number six. The earth used to have a canopy of water overhead or ice. This would make the earth like a big greenhouse. How many know what a greenhouse is? They've got all glass walls you have to dress in the basement in a greenhouse. Carl Ball's book, Panorama of Creation, I think is really good on that topic. You know, a lot of scientists are still finding water in space between the stars. I think there used to be a lot of water above the atmosphere. And scientists have a new theory now about the dinosaurs. They say maybe a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. A lack of oxygen. Why would they say that? Well, because when they studied the Apatosaurus, they found out his lungs are way too small compared to the size of his body, and his nostrils are too small. An 80-foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. Now, how is an 80-foot animal going to get enough air through nostrils the same size as a horse? He'd be sucking so hard trying to get a breath, it set him on fire from the friction from the wind whistling in there. <laughs> they couldn't breathe. Well, you know, apparently dinosaurs did breathe because we find bones of them all over the world. Dinosaurs did live. There's no question about did they live. The question is when did they live and how did they breathe? Their lungs are too small. Their nostrils are too small. That's a simple scientific fact. So we have to come up with an answer to explain the dinosaurs. Well, when you look in amber, which is petrified tree sap, occasionally in amber they find mosquitoes or something. How many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out of the amber? Well, sometimes in amber, they find air bubbles. 
the air bubbles often have 50% more oxygen than we do today. The air you're breathing is 21% oxygen. The air in the amber bubbles is 32% oxygen. I think before the flood came, this canopy of water or ice would increase air pressure, probably to double what it is today. Have you ever gone up or down a hill, you know, and you hear your ears pop from the air pressure change? Remember when I climbed Mount Rainier, I got up around 12,000 foot. I've been at sea level for years now. Here I am at 12,000 foot. I thought, where's all the air up here? <laughs> I was having to take two breaths in order to take one step. I go, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> it's just, it's real thin up there. Well, if you doubled the air pressure, breathing would be easier. And if you increase the oxygen content, that greatly helps again. I think the pre-flood world probably had greater air pressure and increased oxygen. Now what happens under those conditions? Not only does your hemoglobin in your bloodstream take on oxygen, your plasma will get oxygen saturated, which means <clears throat> you could run for hundreds of miles without getting tired. Adam and Eve didn't need a car. They could run to grandma's. <laughs> only they didn't have a grandma. Or a mother-in-law, by the way. <clears throat> That's why it was paradise. No. <laughs> Actually, my wife had a great mother-in-law. Uh, I think, though, before the flood came, things were a lot different. That increased air pressure would sure make you heal up faster. How many of you remember baby Jessica that fell into the well in Texas? She was 18 months old. Her left leg slipped down in the pipe. Her right leg came up behind her, and she slid down 20 feet inside an 8-inch steel pipe. She was down there for two and a half days, they tore up the neighborhood getting that kid out of that well. I mean, it was an amazing rescue. Got to really praise those guys for the work they did. When they got her out, lots of her body had turned black from lack of circulation. Her right leg was totally black. It had been twisted around behind her, stuck in her face from behind for two and a half days. One doctor said, we got to cut her right leg off immediately. Another doctor said, hey, before we start cutting stuff off, let's put her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. They stuck Jessica in a chamber, filled it up full of pure oxygen, and pumped it up to double normal pressure. Within a few hours, her leg turned pink. They restored circulation. They had to cut off half of her little toe. It never, good, never did save that one, but still, it beats losing a leg. By the way, do you know what you call a girl if one leg is shorter than the other? Eileen. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> a little bit of trivia there. Oh. Jessica was absolutely fine after being treated with hyperbaric treatments. They restored circulation. Interesting. The largest chamber in America is in Pensacola, Florida. It can hold 30 people in an emergency. What's that? What, they, what would they have a hyperbaric chamber for? In West Germany, they're treating all stroke patients with hyperbaric oxygen and getting amazing recovery from strokes. In England, they're treating multiple sclerosis. In India, they're treating leprosy with hyperbaric treatments. Here's a kid being treated for cerebral palsy. They're finding now if they give people more oxygen during surgery, only half as many get nauseated and only half as many have infections afterwards. This chamber in New York is being used to treat people with neurological disorders like autism with hyperbaric oxygen. They have many one-person chambers in the world today. The Dallas Cowboys have a hyperbaric chamber. Now question. Why would the Dallas Cowboys want a hyperbaric chamber? Well, they've discovered their injured players will heal twice as fast. And if you're paying the guy $1,000 a minute to go play with a ball, you want him out there playing with the ball, not sitting on the sideline, right? I think the whole world probably had hyperbaric conditions before the flood came. You can get your own hyperbaric sleeping bag if you want. Michelle, or Michael uh, Jackson has one. He says it's going to make them live forever. Well, that's just what we need, you know. Here's my son, Kanandu, back there on the camera, and his wife and I at an oxygen bar in Alaska. You go in to eat lunch, and you pay five bucks, and you breathe pure oxygen while you're eating. After about 15 minutes of breathing pure oxygen, now it's not under pressure, but still, you're breathing pure oxygen. You walk away saying, wow, let's get back to work. Let's go shop some more, you know, which is probably the hidden agenda. Um, a friend of mine in Oregon has his own hyperbaric chamber. cost a quarter million dollars. He let me go in it for six times. We got, took, they call it a dive. If you sit in there, they close the door and they pressurize it. I got up to triple atmospheric pressure. After about an hour in there, all your plasma is saturated with oxygen. I got out. I, I felt like running around the world. I couldn't believe it. 
felt like I was 19 years old again. Like, man, let's, let's go jog someplace. You know? It's incredible, the energy level. Dr. Mori, uh, Ki Mori uh, in Tokyo, uh, Keio University in Tokyo, started raising a tomato plant under pressurized carbon dioxide, so I've heard, and filtered sunlight. He blocked out the UV light. His tomato plant grew a little faster than normal, and it kept growing and growing and growing. And they said, wow, this thing's getting bigger. After two years, it had produced 900 tomatoes and was 16 feet tall. They moved it to a shopping center, built scaffolding to hold up the branches, and it kept growing and growing. They said, they took it to Expo 85 and said, this plant might produce 10,000 tomatoes. It ended up growing 40 feet tall, producing 15,000 tomatoes in its lifetime. One tomato plant. That's a tomato tree. <laughs> now this was a cherry tomato plant. You know, the little cherry tomatoes you put on your salad. But his tomatoes were coming off baseball size. Can you imagine if the whole world had hyperbaric conditions like that before the flood came? The plants would grow like crazy. You would need the dinosaurs just to mow the grass. <laughs> As a guy in Iowa got curious, you know, why do the birds start chirping an hour before sunrise? He found out the chirping of the birds is a frequency that helps open up the plant cell, stomata, on the bottom of the leaf, and it lets the plant start breathing in the morning. It helps, that's the alarm clock, it wakes the plant up. He found out that that frequency is found in music, it's classical music, quite a bit. So he started playing classical music to his cornfield. His neighbors thought, you know, un poquito loco a la cabeza, you know. Some... <laughs> He's a couple fries short of a Happy Meal, but... Uh, until his corn grew 15 feet tall. And he said, uh, what channel was that you're playing? <laughs> when he played the music to his squash plants, they produced five squash per leaf instead of one. He played it to his black walnut tree and it grew twice as fast as normal. Called Sonic Bloom. It's a combination of vitamins for the plant and special frequencies to open up the stomata.